Good evening and welcome to the event Shaping the Past, Black Digital Futures. My name is Nina Wichmann and I'm the director of the Goethe Institute in Toronto. This event tonight is part of the ongoing project Shaping the Past, a transnational exchange bringing artists and experts together to highlight ongoing critical memory interventions in sites and spaces in North America and Germany. Shaping the Past is designed by the Goethe Institute and Philadelphia's Monument Lab, as well as the German Federal Agency for Civic Education. Germany has a long history of coming to terms with its past. Much focus has been placed on the memorialization of the Holocaust. While Germany has come a long way, there's still a lot of reckoning to be done. Facilitating conversations and work between German and North American experts and artists in this field is important to us. And we are privileged to be able to listen to and learn from Canadian artists and experts. The memory workers for Shaping the Past realize projects using art, activism, history, journalism and other tools to approach monuments in their communities. The Canadian multimedia artist Quentin Versetti is a fellow of this Shaping the Past cohort. He is an award-winning multidisciplinary visual storyteller, an art educator and activist. He is also co-founder and director of the Black Speculative Arts Movement. His project, Missing Black Techno Fossils Here, uses augmented reality, digital 3D art and printing to address the absence of monuments to black bodies in Toronto and across the Canadian landscape. One of Quentin Versetti's mentors is Vancouver-born artist and professor Ken Lam. We look very forward to, a, to the conversation between Ken Lam and Quentin Versetti tonight. Moreover, we will welcome Doris Turnstall to our digital stage, who is the Dean of Design at OCAD University, Quentin Versetti's alma mater. The Goethe Institute in Toronto thanks all partners and participants for their work in the project and for participating in this virtual format tonight. We are now happy to welcome Elder Janelle Skerritt, who is joining us with a libation and an acknowledgement of the ancestors. Thank you very much for welcoming me. And here today, I'm going to perform a libation ritual. And in the African tradition, the libation ritual is a call and response. So I will be pouring, uh, this is a vial of water, a vase of water into the calabash representing the earth. And uh, as I do so, I'll first uh, acknowledge the creator. Uh, I will acknowledge mother earth. I will acknowledge the elemental spirits. And then I will uh, have a call and response section in which we will call on specific ancestors to join us here today. And then I uh, will give some intention uh, along the lines of what we're here to do. And that will, uh, and, and I, uh, your response when I say uh, drink and quench your thirst is nsa, which means drink. So if everyone can do that uh, along with me, I'll begin now. First, I want to start by acknowledging that we are here on the land belonging to the indigenous people, and we are treaty people, so we share in the dish with one spoon responsibility to care for the environment, to care for each other, and to live in a loving presence with one another. I call on Onyame Nsa. Nsa. Onyang Kampong Nsa. Nsa. Obadje Nsa. Inside. That is God who is all-knowing, God who is ever-present, and God who is the great builder. Anansi Kokorutu, the great spider. I call Inside. on Mother Earth, Asaseya Nsa. 
Now I will call on the elemental spirits. Abasom, Nana, Essie, to protect the children. Nsa, drink and quench your thirst. Abasom, Asodjebe, the fire and intensity to bring that spirit to us. Drink and quench your thirst. Nsa. Nsa. Nanatanu, to cleanse our spirits. Drink and quench your thirst. Nsa. Nana Ampuedo, for playfulness and curiosity. Drink and quench your thirst. Nsa. Nsa. Nana Tigari, for justice, sharpness in war. Drink and quench your thirst. Nsa. Nana Nam Fo, we now call upon the ancestors. It is Janelle, Abna, your daughter, your sister, your mother, who is calling. And today I call on you to join us to celebrate the opportunity to recognize the contributions of people of African descent across the world but also here in Canada, starting with those in Toronto and reaching that out to touch the hearts of everyone in the nation. It is Janelle, drink and quench your thirst. Nsa. 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 And so the purpose that we are here today is to celebrate and to acknowledge and to recognize the contributions of many through the artwork of Quentin Varsetti. And so I ask Quentin, please, who are the names of the ancestors that you're calling today? Marcus Garvey. Nsa. Amy Garvey. Nsa. Peggy Pompadour and her children. Nsa. Donald William Henry Moore. Nsa. And all those who we may not know and those whose names we are yet to know. Nsa. And so we remember all those who have made the journey from the continent successfully and who lived and strived to build this country. Drink and quench your thirst. Nsa. Inside. And to all those who did not make it, we say to you, we admire your spirit, your tenacity, and your sacrifice. Insa. Insa. So we just want to say thank you to all those who are called and all those who are not called. Insa. Drink and quench your thirst. Insa. We seek forgiveness for all those who any wrong that we may have done. And we thank the creator for our life, for our family, for our community. And we go forth in this journey and today in love. And we wish love only to all those who we touch. It is finished and it is good. Madasi, Madasi Pa, Yo, Ayako. Thank you so much. Give thanks. Thank you, Auntie Janelle. Without further ado, we're going to take you on a walking tour at this moment. And I want to thank uh, the Guta Institute Monument Lab and all those who helped to make this event possible. And thank you for all those who are here watching live and those who are going to watch this in the future. So without further ado, we are going to go on a virtual tour. Since we're socially distancing, I don't need this, uh, this mask, actually. And so today's tour, we're going to be looking at some monuments downtown, but more specifically, 
what are the spaces and places in Toronto where our technophiles is not being represented? And when I say our, I mean people of African descent. This is a year, we are in the decade of people of African descent. And uh, this is a really interesting year where we are paying a lot of attention to public space, public memory, and public monuments. When I traveled to Jamaica, when I traveled to a lot of places where black people lived, there were so many things that reminded me of my culture. There were so many things that reminded me of where I came from. In Toronto, I quickly became aware that there was a lack of representation. There was a lack of honoring the ancestors. I realized a lot of the monuments were to war. I thought it was really interesting that there was nothing that really spoke to people who contributed to peace, contributed to the fabrics and the central parts of Toronto and the, the identity of Canada that didn't cost other people's lives. So this monument that we're looking at here, dedicated to the Boer War, it was the British fighting the Dutch for power over South Africa as it relates to colonization. The British enlisted the Canadians, but more importantly brought African-Americans, slaves to fight against the Boers and also against the Africans who were fighting for their independence from the Dutch. Why this monument is so problematic is because it led to the apartheid system, which was created by Canadian soldiers. This monument was created in 1910 by Walter Seymour Albert and was commissioned by former military officer turned senator and banker James Mason. He paid what would have been equivalent to $5 million to complete this work. The monument pays homage to the Boer War of South Africa, which enabled the complete colonization of the Southern African region and the apartheid system by European powers. Canada supplied 50,000 horses for the South African War and had 267 Canadian casualties losing their lives in it. But what is absent from this monument is the acknowledgement of the African people who were forced to fight in this war against other African people, along with there is no regards for the black Africans who were ultimately affected by the war's aftermath. This project called Missing Black Technofossils here is also about reimagining public space and engaging with these public art monuments. Rather than tearing them down, we should investigate and be critical of them. And so I created this monument, which is to represent all ancestors and to represent multiple ancestors. You wanna aim for a flat surface. So right now I'm aiming for the stairwells. And then you wanna press the button, this little box here that activates your camera and your AR, and it places it. If you wanna rotate it, you can use two fingers. You can position it however you want. For me, I'm gonna position it to the past because we're looking at the past, not the present. And it's in conversation with them. But then you can even have it replace the monument itself. And so I wanna give you a chance to walk around and engage. You can go closer, see all the details. And think about the ancestors who are affected by this history, or whose names are not represented on this relic. So this historical monument that we're gonna to go to is someone who really sought to heal the wounds of the city and really sought to uh, create a change in society for the betterment of all people, not just black people, but the entire culture of the city. His memory should be more than just stored as a plaque, but we need to see who he was. One of the things that Tanya Ennis spoke about in her essay about the lack of black representation in art is an act of erasure is because if you don't see a likeness of something, you can't connect to it. If you're not seeing black people stored, their memory stored in society, 
as something valued and something invested in, like a $5 million uh, monument, then in your psyche, you know, I was going to think that these people are not valuable. If you're the black person, like that black officer who just passed by and gave me a wave, you're going to think that black people who look like you are also not valuable because you don't see yourself reflected. You don't see your likeness. So now we're going to be heading to another foundational memory. And there is a memorial piece that commemorates this historical figure. But oftentimes people think that he's white because of his name. And so this is Donald William Moore. And uh, Donald William Moore is a very, very important ancestor. He passed away recently at the age of 102. And he created a lot of, a lot of changes in the city of Toronto. It's a great that the city of Toronto gave him a plaque, but that plaque tells a very small story of who he is. Born in 1891 to parents who were once enslaved, Donald Moore was an immigrant from Barbados who came to Canada in 1913. Donald first lived in St. John's Ward and engaged in various businesses and activism to improve life for immigrants. His business grew and Moore became quite successful but turned around to continue to help the community. He helped to create and purchase a property for Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association, Toronto's chapter, in 1920. By 1954, he was a well-known activist. Moore protested the immigration law discrimination, which ultimately led to him becoming the first black delegation at Parliament. For his work to reform immigration policy and to increase employment opportunities for Black, African, and West Indian communities, he received the Order of Canada Medal in 1989. Despite being a high-profile figure with many photographs, a public memorial that preserves what Uncle Don, as some might call him, looked like, still does not exist. This house that we see here right now, almost the original building, he, he operated several businesses and also provided office space for a lot of black entrepreneurs. This plaque, again, was installed in 2000 and it was, it's definitely appreciated, it's very definitely important because it marks a historical place, a historical time, and a historical memory. But there's no likeness. When we see Donald Willis Moore, we don't know who he is. You know, when we see Barbados, we don't know that necessarily that he was a black man, a dark-skinned man who went through very, very, very hardships just because of who, how he looked and, uh, and the way that he was born. And so I would imagine that this place, or even one of the other places, maybe in St. John's Ward or somewhere around the city, that his story could be told through having a representation of his likeness. And so I want to encourage you to go into the app, on the website, and then while you're in it, take a snapshot. I want to encourage you to send it to me. Send it to me because I would love to post it and to show the different variants of people who engage in this workshop and who creatively place missing technofossils in the landscape of Toronto. Just by that tree, just behind the sign, and I'm gonna rotate it. And all you have to do to snap a picture of it is you just press this button right here. I might get this, this sunlight right here. Go down. You now be creative with it. And so these are actual African ancestral masks. And it's to represent duality of the spirit, both in the physical and spiritual dimension. These are known as masquerader masks, and these are often masks that were used in ceremonies. I wanted to represent a mask that actually exists. And so this mask is from Ivory Coast. And then the other one is a hybrid mask from Ghana of the Ewe people. And the reason why I chose these two places is to represent the Francophone and Anglophone places, which both have doors of no return and doors of return, which were major ports 
for exportation of African slaves. But also these were places of resilience where they actually fought against the oppression and uh, against enslavement of African people. So a lot of history um, that relates to these two masks. And so we're gonna be heading to the John Ward, one of the most important parts of Toronto's history that is not celebrated, that is not documented, and that is not uh, represented. And is definitely a technofossil that is missing here in Toronto. St. John's Ward was founded in the 1700s. And back then, essentially, this was all farmland. None of this existed. John's Ward essentially was a settlement for newcomers and immigrants in the 1700s. First starting off with the Irish and Italians, but also a lot of runaway slaves, enslaved people. Also as a refuge for First Nations people, uh, indigenous folks who uh, escaped residential schools and they resided in John's Ward. It was also a very vibrant multicultural space within the city. And it, it very much represented what would later on become a representation of what Toronto is now, which is a space that embraced multiculturalism and then everyone kind of worked together the Ward is a nickname for St. John's Ward, which was a multicultural immigrant neighborhood that existed in 1780 to 1960 in the core of what would become downtown Toronto. This neighborhood quickly became a refuge for former enslaved African people. Some of the notable people who came here was William Still in 1854, along with the Blackburns, who later on went to create the first taxi company in 1834. A notable person who lived here was Cecile Reynolds, a successful entrepreneur and teacher at the first African school in the region. She later on left the neighborhood to join Frederick Douglass in his work in abolition in America. But before moving, Cecilia Jane Reynolds just so happened to sell her property at 31 Center Street to a shoemaker from New York named Francis Griffin Simpson. Griffin would become a columnist for abolitionist George Brown and quickly became a community voice. Griffin went on to buy large properties at 26 and Liberty Street, which now is Nathan Phillips Square Snack Bar. Griffin would help tremendous amount of people with the work that he was doing. And he also created properties that would operate as housing units for people who could not afford a place to live. But as you can see at this site, there are no plaques, signage, or any picture fossils or memorials that tells the stories of people like Francis Griffin Simpson, Cecilia Jean Reynolds, or the vibrant community that were once here. All these were houses and businesses of African-Americans who came to Canada to find refuge. And as we try to imagine walking down this invisible street, all of this was our houses and a vibrant community. But the place that I want to focus on and where we're going to end our tour is a place where Francis G. Simpson used to live. He moved to Toronto from New York City. He was born free. And here in Toronto, he became a spokesperson and a community activist. And so this snack bar that you see right here was actually where Francis G. Simpson used to live. This whole snack bar. It's a pretty big house back in the 1800s. Here, while he lived in John's ward, he would actually advocate for the rights of black people in Canada. And so Francis G. Simpson actually worked with Marcus Garvey and Donald William Moore to create the first UNIA house as St. John's Ward continued to be a housing space for a lot of predominant and well-known black people. There's a lot of history that's buried here, but there's nothing 
no matter where you look around, there's nothing that tells you about the history of the black people who were here, the history and the legacies that were here at John's Ward. And so I want to encourage you now to go into the second app. First thing you got to do is you're going to scroll down and you're going to press play. Look around you. Focus your lens on a flat And surface. then you're going to activate the AR. Recognize that shaping the past is to forge the future through casting the mold of the present, which you are doing right now. Missing Black Techno Fossils here looks at absent, erased, and not yet told memories and narratives of Black African Canadians that is not publicly accessible. But together, we can recover some of these unveiled data. Peggy Pompadour was an enslaved African woman who arrived in the town of York, now Old Toronto, in 1793. She was a talented cook, soap, and candle maker. She routinely ran away from her owner and was constantly thrown in jail for truancy and slave resistance. She encouraged other slaves to run away and almost incited an uprising. This woman of defiance is a deserving of a permanent fixture that capsules and illustrates the memory and history of our ancestor, Peggy Pompadour. The past is a mold for the present. In 1937, Jean Augustine was the first black female member of parliament in 1993. And in 2002, she became the first black woman in cabinet. Her legacy includes the federal declaration of black history month in February, a motion she introduced in 1995. In 2010, a small park was named after her. And in 2016, a Brampton high school was named in her honor. This country needs a permanent fixture that acknowledges Jean Augustine Augustine as a living ancestor that features her vast contribution to Canadian and world history. The present and the past forges the possibility of materiality for the future. Saron Gebre Selassie is a multilingual human rights lawyer and entrepreneur and community activist for social change. She's won lawsuits against Starbucks and the Toronto Police Department, as well as numerous human rights cases helping activists and protesters from the Black Lives Matter movement. One day, we hope to honor her with a public technofossil or permanent fixture that capsules the memory, story, and achievement to honor her work while she's a living ancestor. Greetings, I'm Dory Tesla the faculty designed at OCAG University. Welcome. Greetings, I'm Dory Tesla the faculty designed at OCAG University. Welcome to Black Digital Features, a virtual walking tour and AR launch with Quinn Persetti at the Buta Institute here in Toronto. I think it's really important to talk about the way in which the moment we are now, the zeitgeist for the moment now around Black Lives Matter and COVID-19 and what it means in terms of digital engagement. How this sets an important and meaningful context for the work that you're going to be experiencing from Clinton. Black Lives Matter yesterday, Black Lives Matter today, and Black Lives Matter in the future. And the main work of the social movement and the way in which Black communities and their allies have been galvanized to march in the streets, to set up petitions, to call our institutions into question for failing us. All of this has to do with our desire to create a future in which Black lives um, exist and a future in which Black lives are not at risk every day from the institutions that are meant to support us and to welcome. As I said, the judo has become important because COVID-19 and the protocols of social distance has changed the ways in which we must interact and engage with each other. Um, so again, Quentin's work is the moment of this zeitgeist right now that we're in, um, in Toronto, as well as around the world, in which Black 
digital futures speak to the possibilities of Black existences that are not mired in um, systems of social and economic and cultural oppression, but also speaks to the way uh, the digital can be a tool of liberation um, and a tool of community building and communication. Um, and so I hope you enjoy this work by Quentin. Congratulations. And thank you, Guta Institute, for supporting um, such an important work around how Black digital futures matter. Thank you. Hi, Quentin. How are you? I'm good, Ken. How are you? Yeah, I was uh, just uh, looking at that uh, great video you you, you did and um, and thinking about you know Nathan Phillips Square and I know that that was the original multi ethnic area of Toronto mm -hmm. and in the name of um, urban renovation right uh, it's always they pick the uh, marginalized population uh, uh, areas of a city to expand such as the Spadina Highway which. Thank God was, uh, was was stopped, and um, I also think about um, Afrikville in in uh, in Halifax. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, um, the African uh, freed Africans and escaped African slaves settled there for well over a hundred years, and um, yeah. and yet you know, well into the twentieth century, uh, the city council of Halifax zoned it for you know industrial waste uh, treatment plants. And so on. And then I also think about uh, my own hometown, where I grew up in Vancouver, Hogan's Alley, right, which was also destroyed because of an interurban uh, plans for an interurban highway that would have also taken out Chinatown, right? So, and and then I also think about Philadelphia, mm. where I live, and uh, you know, Philadelphia's soul is African, right? Because you know, African uh, Americans have been in Philadelphia even before the uh, revolution. And it, today it constitutes over 40% of the city's population. And it wasn't until 2017 that one of its uh, intell young intellectuals was murdered well, uh, over 100 years ago um, by a racist. Uh, he, he became the first full-figured um, African-American uh, Philadelphian to have a statue in Philadelphia officially. Wow. Right? I mean, so, I mean, your project, um, that it's a it's a it's a necessary one, but it's a it's a there's a lot of work to do, right? In your case, absolutely, yeah. And um, and also in Montreal as well, right? Little Burgundy right. is another uh, community as well, uh, which I live not too far from. And um, yeah, it's interesting because as it relates to Monument Lab, it's like there's so many memories to preserve, essentially, you know, and there's so much stories to be told. And then in contrast to that, then there are these monuments that kind of represents the erasure of a lot of those stories, you know? Um, and so I don't know if you want to speak on like how Monument Lab has been exploring, like challenging some of these ideas of how we preserve memory and, and also how we engage with um, that erasure. Right, well, I mean, what, what, the Monument Lab is a project whereby we, um, think about what's not included in terms of the system of representation that do dominates urban landscapes. Mm -hmm. right? What dominates urban landscapes, of course, is, is, is the representations of power that has taken place, is in place, and has also extinguished alternative histories, particularly the, uh, the voices of the poor, the voices of otherness, the voices of black people, uh, and so on, right? So it becomes very uh, hegemonic. Right and and Monument Lab uh, tries to uh, glean the uh, what's what's not recognized as official history. Right, mm -hmm. even when I say that, I, I I know one of your heroes is Marcus Garvey, and I think about his his belief that the you know the 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 word is more powerful than the pen. Right, in the mm -hmm. sense that the uh, living uh, intergenerational passing of memory continues to haunt. All of Canada and continues to haunt the United States. Continues to haunt so many places in the world, right? It doesn't. It doesn't go away, right? So um, I mean, that is the that is the project of Monument Lab and, and why 
you're a fellow of Money Lab and why we, 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 we support you and, and so on. I, I, I wanted just to talk a little bit about your, your project also uh, in, uh, in Toronto, which is a remarkable project, but also uh, because I was kind of mentoring you as uh, you kindly and generously uh, framed it, uh, my relationship to you, even though I see you as a peer. Um, but I realized that, um, you know, you, you, you're naturally very talented as an artist, but also that you didn't have enough uh, tools in terms of the in terms of the administrative knowledge of how um, public art functions in, 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 in a city as a branch of politics, as a branch of bureaucracy and so on. And I think, um, and, and that opened up my eyes, right? Because I, that was something I had to learn over many, uh, uh, many years. And, um, and I think for Mindwet Lab, to, you know, I think that's something which we will try to branch into to give support in terms of just just um, you know, fortifying knowledge, necessary knowledge in terms of the mundane procedures of how do you negotiate and navigate uh, budgeting, um, you know, uh, once uh, and and even uh, applications for RFQs uh, by uh, African Canadian or African Americans uh, or any uh, marginalized uh, voice for public art uh, competition. So I really appreciate. Uh, that uh, I found that quite uh, enlightening. Uh, my 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 meetings with you about that. Absolutely, I mean, you definitely saved me. It was like you were like the insurance for the insurance that I needed in a sense of, uh, you know, there was a lot of you pointing out there was a lot of loopholes and things of for things I need to think about, and um, you know, through your your guidance, you know, I started to look into those things, and I was like, oh my gosh, I need to have. WSIB, I need to have, you know, I mean, insurance for the insurance. I need to make sure, like, the people I work with is also covered, like, you know, all these different things. And then also, um, just even the process of, like, how do I want to tell the story and, and not overcompensate it, you know? Um, because you gave me such, like, critical advice that I was like, I was like, you know what? That not only saved me thousands and thousands of dollars with this monument, but it also, um, I didn't have to sacrifice um, the, the the actual integrity of the story, you know, um, because I was, you know, unsure of different things or, or because I thought certain things had to work a certain way, you know, like the counterbalance. I was like, oh, I need to put this because it needs to counterbalance and not realizing that the counterbalance is in just the, the securing of the monument, you know. Right. So, I guess I guess what I'm saying is that the the lack of familiarity with the uh, with the uh, you know how to navigate administrative rules right the rules of bureaucratic politics is is often um, a deterrent uh, for marginalized voices to participate. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And, and so it's like this anchor, which is already because there's always this demand of like, uh, well, how, why would you not know? Well, you you we were never given the opportunity. You were never given the chance to learn, right? And that's and that and and that's actually a function of privilege, right? Yeah. And, and so on. And um, but it's never recognized as privilege, right? It becomes normalized, right? And so you have a lot of let's just say uh, uh, white artists and so on, and uh, usually white men artists, and they they already know all these rules. They know how to negotiate this because they grew up in that setting where uh, you know they became acculturated very young yeah. uh, within that system, and so on. So you know, I really. Uh, uh, it was a, a very uh, eye-opening for me in, in in my discussions with you because I thought, wow, you know, you, you you clearly have the talent, and to me, that's the most important thing. But I also know the way bureau bureaucracies work, which is that unless you somehow meet them in, in terms of their own language, yeah. that it doesn't matter how talented you are. Yeah. Right? And it's a real and it's a real kind of built-in bias against against p artists of color. Yeah. So and. And what's interesting with that is like even just the process to get a monument done, it's not always based on like what you think or what I personally think needs to be done, right? Like mm -hmm. Joshua Glover, unfortunately, was never on my list, you know, of of people that uh, that I felt like needed to be um, honored first, right? So it was interesting that that opportunity came after um, I started the Monument Lab Fellowship, right? And 
and I already had like my list was super long. And again, uh, with the support of Monument Lab, I had to reduce it down to six people for each city. You know, originally I had like 30 people in mind, which was like crazy, you know, but it was just a goal to show the, the, the depth of history and the depth of erasure that, that has been occurring um, in these marginalized communities. Right. And that, what, it, sorry, what I appreciate about your idea is that it's not simply depictive. I mean, it's largely depictive and, and, and takes the form of, um, you know, rep, uh, representational um, busts and, 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 and statuary, right? But, but it doesn't operate that way. That's what I, yeah. that's what I think is quite subversive about the, the work. It's subversive on, on two levels, right? One is of, a, you know, African-Canadian, uh, which you don't see uh, uh, enough of. And so it's subversive to that degree. But even that, gen often when someone of color is depicted, it's depicted in the most traditional, conventional way of depiction, right? You're standing mm -hmm. on a plane bus, or you're standing holding onto a scroll, or you're sitting on a horse, or, or, or what yeah. happened, right? But in your case, you're really playing around with different things. And so it actually further upsets the the conventional way we look at depictive uh, sculpture, particularly a bus, right? Mm -hmm. And so you can comment on that. That part I thought was remarkable. Yeah, I mean, again, like, as I was speaking about in my video, like a lot of it was informed from the places I traveled to, right? So uh, like going to Zimbabwe and going to South Africa and like seeing the type of monuments that they had, it wasn't traditional, traditional. Um, and also if it learning about the, the depth of the history and how it predates colonial time periods, I realized what, what we considered to be classical was very Eurocentric in its perspective and very limited. And so um, even recently I came across this term called counter monument and the idea of the dialogical, you know? Mm. And, um, and I never ever thought of my work being counter monument or dialogical because I always thought that it was still in that line of tradition of what people typically thought of monuments as, but because it's confronting um, a very specific way that monuments were, go were, were being approached it was considered counter, but then whereas, whereas where I'm coming from, of uh, being of African descent and also like Jamaica and also the places I travel to in the diaspora, like I realized that it's not counter monument. It's mm. really just being inclusive and being expansive because if you're representing your ancestors, if you think of something as simple as an African mask, as you can see right. on my wall, it is interpretive and is based on spiritual um, elements, right? So what we were considered to be abstract, uh, to a lot of them, like these carried a lot of weight and meaning and metaphorical meaning. And so that's something I wanted to carry over, you know, especially with my interest in Afrofuturism, uh, where I'm, I'm, I'm essentially citing and, and sampling and, and, and remixing things from the past right. and bringing it to the present for the future. And so, um, that's essentially why my work Right. It, it looks the way it does, especially for the missing black technofossils, because um, even this mask here, next to the Black Panther mask, um, and rest in peace to Chadwick Boseman, um, like that piece is an uh, is an ancestral mask, and it, and it represents like the ge geometric uh, carvings. They all are are telling a message, right? They all represent a story as it relates to the village, and so um. Yeah, we yeah. have actually, essentially, like that, that's what the work's about, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I know that counter monuments so often deal with absence, right? And so, you know, you, your African uh, presence is already absent in terms of statuary. So counter monuments, I, I agree, it doesn't really work work in that context. We have some uh, questions in the, in, in the chat. Uh, someone asked, how can um, problematic monuments be contextualized? Hmm in landscapes in education. Do, do you have any thoughts on that or? Yeah, I mean, I, right now my mind is very much caught up on this idea of the paramount, pair monument and the counter monument um, idea. So I think uh, personally the dialogical approach is the best and, and dialogical for those who may not understand that language just means a monument that actually confronts another monument or it's in mm. juxtaposition or <clears throat> opposition in a way and it challenges that monument from its mere presence, you know? And so there's so many different ways to do that. Yeah. And um, especially in Germany, uh, I've seen a lot of that, right? With 
with uh, monuments that were about war and then juxtaposing it with monuments about peace, you know, or the monuments that celebrated Hitler or, or the, that like certain time periods. But then there was beside monuments or the, the, the thing that contrasted was a monument about the, the Jewish people, for example, et cetera, et cetera. So I think um, there's enough public space for that to happen. Right, and uh, I guess he was asking me too. And I mean, I think there are certain monuments that uh, really don't deserve to be contextualized, and other ones do. And um, for example, Confederate monuments uh, that were put up in the 1920s, 1930s, in front of courthouses throughout the South, they don't really deserve to be contextualized because they project a false history that never existed. And so, and well after you know, 70 years after the conclusion of the Civil War. So I support their uh, removal, right? And uh, but I also think that for a lot of problematic monuments, before even exercising removal, there should be a response, creative response from all kinds of thinkers, artists, uh, voices of color, um, academics, what have you, right? And they can they can have a kind of go at, in terms of a like you what you say, Quentin, in terms of a dialogue. Um, in contextualizing it, but not necessarily in academic language, but through creative and artistic uh, responses. Um, and I think that's also important, of course, in conjunction with with revamping uh, curriculum in, in schools, particularly for children, so that they, they understand the diversity of histories, which they aren't properly getting right now. There's a, another question here. Um, it says, uh, I'd be interested in Quentin's and, and Ken Lam's ideas of how monuments could be used to facilitate and foster dialogue between different communities. Hmm. I mean, I said it to you when you we were on the phone, and I think that's my answer for this, which is collaboration. Like, I would love to collaborate with you one day, Ken. And um, I think that's some of the best ways to facilitate that dialogue between communities. Because also, like, if you just think about the ward alone, like that wasn't just black people living there. It was also some of the early Asian community. Yeah. Right. Like a lot of the that was like pretty much the early Chinatown, right? Yeah. So, right. Yeah. And then even with the Joshua Glover story, like you know, like w that Montgomery Inn was also the house to was uh, housing to the Chinese farmer market. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of ways that like history overlaps, especially in a place like Canada, and I think um, collaboration personally to me is the way to go. Right, I agree. I think the fraternity and sorority of of um, different colored peoples in, in Canada, certainly in Toronto, right? It, you can it, basically it, it it haunts the square, Nathanfield Square, because their their voices are underneath that concrete, right? In the parking lot, perhaps underneath, and um, and there should be some recognition and acknowledgement of that. But I, I agree in answer to uh, Yule's uh, Yule's question. Um, you know, we're doing that right now. We're we're having that a, a kind of dialogue and and um, and uh, and you know, fomenting a kind of uh, and trying to create a new normal, right? A new normal that is that recognizes the diversity that it that is the world and, and yeah. such. Um, there's another. Oh, okay. This one's for me, I guess. Do I, I misremember? Do you actually have a work on Nathanson Square? Yeah, I, I do have a work on Nathanson Square. It is a, it's a memorial to the uh, the uh, um, Canadian uh, who fought in um, uh, Ortona. It's a specific battle in Second World War. It was a very brave uh, battle uh, by, on the part of Canadians. Uh, uh, over 1,200 uh, Canadians died within a matter of like a few days. It was basically the Stalingrad of, of Canada. It was a vicious house-to-house -house fighting. And I was asked to do a, a monument, right? But I didn't want to do a war mark. I mean, I didn't want to do it in a conventional sense of a war memorial, uh, especially given that it's in proximity to uh, a well-used playground uh, on the, on the uh, western side of, uh, of City Hall. And so I made it so that uh, it was a map of the destruction of Ortona. So, you know, and, and very often when you do memorials about war, you don't show the aftermath of war. And I wanted that to be explicit and on and it's very low down it's on the level that children can actually see see the kind of uh, results of the of the war so yeah i don't know what other questions are, are here i uh i don't see any other questions um mm -hmm. I, 
it's ending now. Which because... is my cue. <laughs> <laughs> Which is my cue. Hello. Thank you so Hello, much. Yuta. Um, thank you, Ken Lum. <laughs> yes, thank you. If you Ken, if you feel like you do want to stay, you're absolutely welcome. We'd ask you to sort of, uh, you know, have a sort of 10, 15 minute chat with uh, Quentin. And um, we want to put more questions out to Quentin, but I realize that, you know, this is so interwoven uh, that we'd love to have you stay if you don't. Uh, I'll, I'll Quentin, if Quentin wants me to stay. <laughs> oh, nobody's of kicking course. you out. Of uh, first can. of all, thank you, Dory. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Quentin, yes. uh, for all this, this amazing content already. And uh, by the way, if you're not following uh, these three in particular on Instagram, which I do, then you are really missing out in, in a lot of ways. Um, just a reminder that you can send us uh, questions via Facebook and Twitter's live comment sections. I just tried that out myself for the first time and I'll keep an eye uh, on them as they appear. But I will also um, just try to kick off uh, a, a wider conversation uh, by bridging over from what Dory uh, and you probably noticed verbally and visually uh, just mentioned with a connection between our theme, black digital futures, and imagining, as she said, an existence free from oppression. And um, just for Quentin, and maybe Ken can chime in later with his comments on, on what media he's working in as well. Quentin, when did augmented reality as a tool uh, come in uh, for you in this project? Was that a visual extension of your current uh, uh, physical reality in your mind's eye when you started? Uh, what does that technology afford us um, when we want to express insights about black pasts, presence, and future? So basically, why AI uh, uh, augmented reality for this particular work? Yeah, I was I was thinking of like the Wachowski sisters, uh, of, like with the Matrix and just like this idea of like trying to fit as much information into one thing and, and delivering it and um but recognizing that the technology wasn't there yet you know so they I had to create the technology you know and you was use what's already existing and so my idea was to create an actual temporary monument that actually would have like a hologram that was actually actually my idea mm -hmm. because i wanted a monument that would represent multiple histories and the fact, the idea that you can program this monument to continue to tell more stories. So essentially, it will be like a library. And it was inspired by Octavia Butler. Um, she has a book called um, Pattern Master. And in Pattern Master, there's an artist. And the artist has a telepathic ability to take a memory or take anything um, that you can imagine and put it into an object. And anyone who touches that object can also experience that living memory and that living experience. And so um, that's where I thought uh, mm -hmm. technology would take us, you know? And so the augmented reality was essentially that whole idea of like allowing you to experience another reality and um, essentially the black reality. And the black reality is knowing about our ancestors, knowing about who came before us and laid the foundation for us to be here today. And so um, augmented reality allows that to happen because I can keep adding to it nonstop. Even though I presented this walk, I can keep adding more histories to it, which is the plan of uh, of this entire project to keep going and to create a database of 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 the legends of Canada mm -hmm. and um, and mapping it out. Right. So um, the augmented reality also makes it accessible because then it allows for like all different type of engagement. It allows for just imagination to expand. And uh, at the the basis of Afrofuturism is you can't create change if you don't imagine it. And so you have to facilitate the imagination in order to work towards change. You know what, before I ask Ken something specific about uh, switching between media and practices, I just have one follow-up and it's actually triggered by a word in your video uh, narration that, that uh, stuck with me. Um, and also the fact that I know that you have a, a book uh, edited out that's called Afrofuturism 2.0. And here we are again in the digital realm and digital work. Um, and you used, uh, or the word came up in your video of permanence. And that makes me think, mm. of course, of digital work that is more ephemeral. So mm. where where is that 
position for you? I know you have, uh, of course, other uh, parts of your practice as well. So where, what is Afrofuturism 2.0 between ephemerality and permanence, so to speak? Wow, wow, that's, that, whoa. Just that in two sentences. <laughs> um, is it either or, or is it a and? This is the for thing. Um, for me, as it relates to Afrofuturism 2.0, uh, the idea is very Pan-African. And it's very about, very much about the influx of time. And so, if I'm thinking about that from a, from a continental standpoint, then if you're creating content that is about the ancestors, the medium doesn't matter hmm. because the spirit is always permanent. The spirit is always there. That energy is always there. And so, even if the website I created shuts down. The fact that I honor the ancestors that will come up somehow in in the future, you know, and and the fact that people were exposed to this, that kind of lives on, and so that's permanent in a way, in a lot of ways, and um, and so I think about the masquerade, right? This is also why I paid homage to the masquerade because mm -hmm. traditionally, once a mask is used in a ritual or in a ceremony, the mask is destroyed, right? But uh, Europeans came along and wanted to keep the mask. But the the performance and the energy and the and the spirit that that mask held is permanent, not permanent in the mask, but permanent in the memories of those who experienced it, and permanent in the in, in the in the in the frequency of of the earth. And I know this sounds metaphysical and this sounds very airy, but um, if you think about sound waves and if you think about like the the, the wavelengths of like color, now I'm going into science, like these things keep traveling, right? And so essentially my, what I'm trying to say is like, when you're doing work that's ancestral, it keeps traveling. I know that's more than two sentences. Yeah, no, that's, that's brilliant. And that actually gives me uh, a, an opportunity to um, uh, poke Ken about something. And I hope I'm not putting you on the spot again, follow Ken on uh, Instagram, and then uh, you already know about this. Um, I, I was really fascinated, Ken, when very recently you sort of also revealed your uh, a current a project that you're working on that could be your first film, and at this point is a film film script, and that, as far as I know and understand, is a medium you are you have not worked in. You're certainly not known for the work of yours that I've seen at Documenta, or in Kassel in Germany, or at, at Haus der Kultur in der Welt is not that. And it deals with uh, Chinese migration, historic Chinese migration. So again, you could argue the ancestors. And what Quentin just said uh, nearly blew me away and, and knocked me off my chair, that, that that focus on the ancestors really takes the, the format question, not artistically out of the equation, but it, it makes it move into the background. But still, like, why does Ken Lom the visual artist, uh, the conceptual artist, the installation artist, move into that realm of, I will write a film script about this, and it's a Western, if I <laughs> may say so. So if you just want to let us know what you feel comfortable with letting us know about this project. Sure, well, it's it's actually under contract, and uh, it's seen some success uh, uh, by uh, quite well-known Hollywood producers, <laughs> so it's, it's moving along, <laughs> right? But, um, I started it as an extension of a course I was teaching uh, at Penn. I teach various courses. I teach uh, courses about uh, I teach courses about the uh, French uh, uh, history in 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 uh, 20th century Africa, for example, primarily on uh, West West Africa, uh, primarily about the moment of decolonization around the late 1950s through to you know mid 70s, but really late 1950s all the way to the early uh, 60s. When most of the um, uh, Africa was decolonized, but then kind of recolonized, uh, you know, at least uh, w w in these kind of weird relationships of like La Fra Francophonie and and things like that, where you know the the West Africa Af African countries had to have uh, you know uh, the official F uh, Bank of France supporting its currencies and things like that, and so and I taught a course called uh, the Chinese Body. And um, and uh, spatial production in Chinatown, which was about the history of uh, Chinese enclaves in in Chinatown, starting with Limehouse in East London, 
and so on. And then in my research uh, for these courses, which I, you know, I end up reading uh, maybe 20, 20, two dozen to 30 books thoroughly. Um, uh, and uh, I still have the mind where I can actually remember in detail the, the books I re read. That may not be true in about 10 years, but uh, right now. And so um, I, it occurred to me that uh, there's, uh, there's never been a film about, the about contract laborers in the 19th century. And, um, and I was very interested in, uh, in that. Moment. I wasn't interested in, in writing a film script to become a, a screenplay writer. I know it sounds funny to say, right? But it was more like a kind of a, a project that filled my time during uh, intervals between meetings and between classes. I just started doing it. I downloaded uh, McCabe and Mrs. Miller, read it, and then I went uh, by Robert Altman, the great Western film, and then I started writing it. I had no experience writing it. I had no idea there was even screenwriting software, so I wrote it all on computer and using a uh, you know blackboard with not blackboard whiteboard with all kinds of um, post-it notes, right, uh, for to maintain continuity. But uh, but the film the, but it is about Chinese contract laborers and during the transition period of the commerce uh, bodies that is slavery to the commerce of contracts. But it's uh, but it there are it is about the kind of moment uh, post Civil War. That uh, where you had a kind of triangulation of the races, and, and the white dominant um, Americans would be playing one race off after uh, off another uh, mm -hmm. in order to maintain a very cheap salaries and exploit uh, labor and so on. So um, there's there are Native Amer Americans in it, there's African Americans in it, there's Chinese Americans in it, and that intersection was what really kind of um, motivated me to to write this screenplay. You must have done something right if if it goes straight to Hollywood, and uh, maybe we can continue this conversation in that process and and with Quentin's next work. And um, actually, I wanted to ask you about this strange, distorted timeline that we find ourselves uh, in right now. And I think again, it's a question for both of you, but I'll I'll tie it to Quentin's work that we just saw. So. Um, Quentin, I remember reading uh, your proposal for missing black technofossils here about, I'd say, one year, one and a half years ago when you applied for the Goethe Monument uh, Lab Fellowship. Now, you know, in this particular time frame in contemporary history um, that has dramatically and largely through artistic activism changed the conversation around monuments and memorialization in the public space um, and of course with Monument Lab itself becoming a major international catalyst and figurehead more so than it, than it was before. For you as well both Canadian artists in different ecologies, what is the most impactful shift from say spring 2019 when I read about missing black technofossils and fall 2020 now when it comes to rethinking who's represented Right in the in the public space, what is on those pedals pedestals uh, that we walk by? Who makes that work, and who makes decisions about that work and what goes up? Is, is there one thing for each of you in your practice where you go like, amidst of course all the takedowns that we've seen, but wow, I never thought this could happen in 2019, and now it is happening in 2020. Well, I, I can start. Um, I, I think there's. I think there's two two things, not not one thing. One thing. Uh, the first is that um, finally there's a critical mass of support, mm -hmm. recognition of traumatized bodies, traumatized ancestors, and and that's very important because that critical mass was never really there in 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 solid enough numbers and for uh, any duration. You had certain moments of uh, fraternity, you might say, in like the 1960s, certain moments, but never in terms of even like suburban populations, kind of smaller populations in, in smaller cities or smaller towns and so on. It's actually uh, very widespread in uh, the, the support for acknowledgement of the kind of unfair treatment and the of, of particularly black bodies, but also other bodies of differences as well. That's the one thing. But it was also compounded by the fact that COVID-19 made explicit just how unequal uh, society is. The inequality in, in society 
has been um, exacerbated by the trauma of uh, COVID-19. Those who can go to uh, uh, stay home to work can stay home to work. Those who have backyards can their kids can play in their backyards. But those who need to go to work and put themselves at risk or people of color and so on generally and or underpaid or I immigrants they put they have to do so and and they don't have kids that are you know being virtually schooled right now and yet yet who's babysitting them they're very young kids but if you have means and so on so that it's the two factors together which has really been uh, quite amazing yeah, for me, um, I would say what was happening in the UK, uh, that surprised me. Um, the and wind the wash. Of, yeah, and then the yeah. putting up of uh, Jen Reed's statue, the activist, yeah. uh, by uh, sculptor Mark Quinn, that surprised me a lot. Because that was, I, literally, I was like, oh my God, this is, this is what my work is about. Like, <laughs> honoring the leaders that we have today. Like, oh my God, like, you know, and, and the, uh, yeah, and just like, just like people finally understanding like the conversations that my work was trying to facilitate, that was like the big moment for me. And we should maybe also mention, because you didn't mention it, that what has changed is, um, that you have pointed out that there is no statues of black people in Toronto yeah. right now, but now you yeah. are and will be the first black Canadian artist to yeah. create one because you were awarded, uh, and maybe you just want to um, say a few words uh, towards <laughs> that uh, that plan that we have for Tobacco. Yeah, so I'll be the third Canadian black Canadian artist um, after Artist Lane and Dominic Denary, uh, two amazing also mentors to me. Uh, I like to throw out the word mentor because if I learn something from you, you my mentor. <laughs> If I spoke to you on the phone and you gave me your direct number, you, you get thrown in that category. Um, sorry, Ken. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, while doing Monument Lab, uh, I applied to, uh, I submitted some designs for a competition. I didn't know it was a competition at the time. And, and, and uh, surprisingly enough, uh, I got the call back uh, not too long after I submitted saying, um, you know, you uh, and, 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 and won the competition uh, because people really liked the concept, the message behind it. And it wasn't just like a monument. It was, it was literally a tribute that could be uh, that any person can recognize himself in, you know, because I was really focusing on the story of the person and not just trying to celebrate the person. And so, um, yeah, the speculative elements and, and the, the different uh, metaphoric, uh, you know, concepts that I put into it um, is really what caught them um, from like the robotic arm to like, you know, the, the, the posture to like, you know, the different symbols and the flowers and all these different things. Um, and so, yeah, so it's going to be a part of, uh, it's going to be the 16th monument. And if you go to the website, I don't know if you have time to, for me to walk through the website. But um, yeah, if you go to the website, you'll get to see a small archive of all the Canadian um, public monuments of people of African descent. And uh, at the moment, there's only 15 sites. And so I will be making the 16th, uh, 2021. That's coming, that you're going to create it in tw at some point in 2021, right? Was my yeah. understanding. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, it's almost done. Yeah. It's <laughs> almost we, done but the, the official launch will be 2021 yeah um quentin i wanted to ask you something a bit more because of course it it moves me it moves us i think and maybe at the goethe institute to to uh, being in a way between cultures or occupying mul multiple cultural spaces you call uh, probably more more spaces but toronto and montreal home you uh, are a graduate of OCAD University from uh, the place Dory spoke to us, and you are still currently working towards your MA at Concordia University uh, in Quebec. So we're in this project with uh, many of our colleagues, and especially with our colleagues at the Goethe Institute in Montreal. 
And for them too, last weekend you presented, uh, you created and presented a walk, a similar walk, similarly set up walk, conceptualized walk for downtown Montreal. Um, and you, in your this video that we just saw, that's Toronto specific, you were actually also referencing sort of the different French and English uh, settler histories and colonial histories that of course Canada has. How are right now, the discourses about memorialization and public engagement and the public space use different in both cities and Toronto and Montreal. Mm -hmm. You toggle back and forth. Like, what are the, what hits you culturally when you? What's different when you? Or the same, maybe the same when you go back um, and forth. Different conversations yeah. you have there with people. Oh man, it's, it's it is it's day and night. You know, it's day and night. Um, the the cities are so different. And um, the history is extremely different, um, though some similarities um, with both of them being stops in the Underground Railroad, um, mm -hmm. with Montreal being the access actually a lot closer to the United States than Toronto. So people came from Richmond and Virginia straight into Montreal, um, just crossing over the river. And uh, whereas like with Toronto, you have to go all the way around the horseshoe like you you at the time you wouldn't make mm -hmm. it across Lake Ontario. But um I would say one of the main things that struck me with Montreal is the is the the longer history because of course Toronto's known as you know the epicenter, you know, and the, the multicultural city and, and it also has a larger black uh population, but um it doesn't have the older population than Montreal, you know, again, referencing Matthew da Costa, who uh, is one of the first settlers, you know, before Canada was Canada, right, 1604. Um, and he came here with a crew of people. And so there's a, there's a, there's a pride in there that, that comes from that. And um, one of the things that surprised me was like the reluctancy almost to, to let that be known. And I don't quite understand why that's the case. Um, whereas Toronto, like we're constantly digging for a history that we can we can celebrate, um, although we don't celebrate enough for um, Black legacies. And so with Toronto, I think um, because we have the hype, or, or because Toronto has the hype, there's a lot of uh, attention on it. And uh, you know, the Jamaican culture is really strong. The Ghanaian culture is really strong. The Nigerian culture is really strong. Hashtag and SARS, of course. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think I think the main difference also is that identity, you know. So Montreal has really settled into being this this bilingual identity and being uh, this place where Franglish is is a mm -hmm. uh, or, or Joal, you know, is a thing, you know, and um, and people very much consider themselves Quebecois, you know, and 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 there's this pride in, in being from Quebec. And I think Toronto is just catching on to finding this identity and, and, and finding um, a sense of pride in, in being from Toronto and, and the legacy of Toronto. So I think that's some of the two main differences for me that I've often mm. found. Which makes me uh, look at Ken again and trigger something that maybe we don't want to trigger, but I will do it nevertheless. And Ken will stop us if he doesn't doesn't want to go there. But um, in that dichotomy that we just spoke about within uh, Canada, there of course is a dichotomy within North America and Ken is in a way living it, <laughs> being a Canadian, being Vancouver born and uh, living and working in Philadelphia right now. It, it, do you just have like one glimpse, one very personal take on the differences in this memorialization conversation that you see in, between the US and Canada? Yeah, sure. And if I may, just before I even get there, I, I just quickly add that there is something in common between Toronto and Montreal. They both have universities. Uh, uh, Ryerson University, Edgerton Ryerson, pushed uh, actively for residential right. school against Native yeah. Canadians. And um, and there's a I know there's a move afoot to at least try to just change the name of the university. In um, Montreal, you also have a problematic name for a university, which is James McGill, McGill University. McGill was actually a slave owner, in fact, with a 
was a was a proponent of of slavery. So <laughs> that's something in common, at least in terms of dubiously between Toronto and Montreal. Um, I think um, you know I like to think that Canada is a little bit more gentle, a little bit more social democratic in terms of its politics. It probably is. It's certainly less Manichian than in the United States. But I also think um, you know that in uh, America. You know, people. Uh, there's a lot of good people there that kind of will will lay down their bodies to resist uh, tyranny and and resist racism and so on in a very active way. So everything becomes very kind of magnified and and even like elements of courage or whatever solidarity becomes super magnified. I don't know whether that's a good thing or or bad thing. It's certainly magnified compared to my experience in 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 Canada. But, um, and so, you know, very, especially during this Trump, Trump years, you know, my wife and I've often thought we're living on the wrong side of the 49th parallel. And uh, especially for our kids, because we worry about, uh, you know, if Trump, can you imagine if Trump got reelected, we would certainly probably move almost immediately. But I also think Canadians tend to be too complacent about its own, uh, you know, racial history. I, I tried to cite that earlier in terms of Afriqueville and and, um, and and Hogan's Alley and, and and what happened with Nathanfield Square and so on, but also in Canada just in the last uh, few months, right, with the uh, um, First Nations chief in northern uh, Alberta, uh, you know, his wife being slapped around and and uh, and and treated like 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 basically like animals. Uh, recently, with the Mi'kmaq. Uh, uh, you know controversies with with lo lobster fishing which they have uh, rights to and uh, rather than uh, the uh, white lobster fishers saying well we need to work in solidarity with our brothers and sisters and uh, against the exploitative system we're going to blame them for our wolves right and so that's another form of uh, of racism and then of course you had the in in uh, Quebec the the uh, First Nations woman who, who in, in jail and uh, violently so. So I think Canadians shouldn't become too overly complacent when they look at the disaster of the United States that, that is ongoing right now. Yeah, that's a that's a very valid point, and uh, I'm glad you brought up um, the indigeneity uh, question here. And just the, the last two days have been exasperating and and absolutely outrageous uh, i switch on cbc uh, metro morning yesterday and uh, there's the the increased could you believe it water crisis in indigenous communities uh from you know, like not drinkable water now there's no water i mean this is canada there's communities with no water and today the leak that uh, uh the alberta potentially plans on changing the curriculum to largely again eclipse uh, uh, questions of residential schools, uh, etc. So eclipse known, uh, proven h history, right? Um, so it is uh, a scary point in time. We've touched upon the education bit, and I think that's a really, really important one. Um, we don't have much more time. I have one more question because I want to wider these sort of cultural circus and actually take us to Germany. I don't know whether Ken has any. No, he's been, of course, but I don't know whether he has any uh, input on that as well. Perhaps he does. I know that Quentin does. Um, so let's look to Europe for a moment. And this was actually also triggered by something that Quentin said in this video uh, when he talked about the importance of likeness, of like real faces, physical likeness versus just the absence, the complete absence. So sometimes the question is really, okay, but what do we see when we see a monument? Quentin, you've been to Berlin, and I know that you've seen the so-called Mohrenrondel at Sanssouci Park outside of Berlin, uh, which roughly translates to Moore's Circle, Moore's Rondel, four sculptures made in Italy in the late 1600s. And I, I literally kind of dug out this photo so that I don't have to explain it to you more because you see uh, uh, the glaring issues. And it has been controversial in Germany for nearly a decade. When you told me about your visit, I I thought about it for a long time and I tried to imagine how that presented for you in the moment. You're in a different culture. Uh, you don't speak the language. You're 5,000 miles away. You see this depiction of past 
but it's very present because you know Quentin Vassetti is standing in front of it. So literally, like what how did this present to you and what kinds of conversations did you have or how are you are you having about this with German partners and colleagues that I know that you have? And and maybe also, mm -hmm. sorry, as a as a more abstract, I'll set it up because then you can go into a whole flow because um, we wanted to go a bit more abstract on semantics, perhaps, because German amazingly has four words for do, for monument. Mahnmal, mm -hmm. which is a memorial as munition, admonition. Denkmal is a monument as a reminder. Literally, denken is thinking, to think in German. So think about this when you see this, Denkmal. There's an Ehrenmal, which is a uh, monument that honors. And then crucially, and you've brought up this, uh, this English term before, there's the Gegendenkmal, the counter, the anti, the other monument. So maybe that helps us understand this Mohrenrondel outside of Berlin. Yeah, so I was really, so a lot of mixed emotions um, because around that time, that was when, I don't, I would say the height, but maybe it wasn't the height, but for me, it was a really um, intense conversation around the name of the African quarters and renaming the African quarters during that time period. Also, they were talking about renaming another hotel, and then also they were talking about renaming the park. And a lot of these names were going to be very neutral and tells no story. And so um, when I came to this park, um, I was shocked because again, there was no story. And, and, and also the naming of the park is very historically inaccurate uh, because the Moors were never enslaved. And so uh, in fact, they were the, uh, you know, they, they, they occupied and, and uh, conquered Spain and, and parts of Europe. And so it was, so it, it's a very complicated thing for, for, for me to look at this, these statues and also think about it in the context of like how they were showing them um, and in this park with no context, you know? And so it was really, it was really weird for me to process it. But then also at the same time, it was intriguing because it was like, here are these no named figures that represent um, objectification of black people in a lot of ways, but still it pays homage in a way. But it's like the type of memories that's being is being paid homage to was what really, at the end of the day, didn't sit well with me. And um, and so yeah, I was thinking, I was asking people like, well, rather than just changing the name of the park, how do we like are people speaking about and thinking about how to expand the conversation? And this kind of leans back to. Uh, the earlier conversation with, with myself and Ken, where we were talking about the inaccessibility and the barriers that are often created for uh, marginalized people, for marginalized communities, specifically black people, to, to be involved in these conversations um, because there's so many barriers that are put in place to stop them from, from really being involved in the conversation. So they may have the skill set, but then there's all these um, criteria that one has to execute to, to get involved. And so um, essentially from my understanding, the conversation kind of just stopped dead in its tracks. The, the park hasn't changed its name from my understanding. And uh, there's no real conversations around additional monuments or additional contextual work being added like plaques or something, you know? So it was just weird. It was really weird. And, um, but then I felt conflicted because again, back home in Toronto, I was like, you know what? If we had at least a monument of a slave, at least I have a little bit less to complain about, you know? But, um, yeah. but I mean, I, I still have something to complain about because, you know, of course, how we think about black people and the, and the ways that we think about black people for me is an important thing. But um, to see what I consider an anti to be represented in that way and in such an overtly sexualized way and an objectified way really, really set, um, set in, a, in, a, in a hard place for me. And, and I, and I, I left pretty upset, to say the least. And so one day yeah, I hope because, I can be the one. Yeah, because the clash is really everything, right? Yeah. yeah so hopefully yeah, one day I can the be the one. <laughs> gender and, and, yeah. yeah, and sex and race, um, and that's what makes that so so difficult. In a in a park called Sans Souci, 
uh, with no no worries. Uh, you know, it, it really isn't that. And um, you know what, Quentin, I actually did uh, 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 just today. I thought, well, yeah, what what happened to that conversation? Um, and I, I googled it, and nothing happened to that conversation. Um, we actually asked uh, uh, Michael Götting, uh, a black German author, to write a piece for our website um, about his work with e uh each one teach one, and here we are back at, at knowledge uh, generation. And uh, that's a really worthwhile, worthwhile art article about a sort of a, you know, mid-career, uh, mid-life uh, black artist in Berlin and his work uh, in Berlin and Germany to to change the conversation. And they are literally uh, situated physically in that so-called African quarter that you mentioned, uh, that is just marked by a lot of street problematic street names and the question of street renamings. I fear we have run out of uh, out of time. Uh, it has been uh, one and a half hours. It didn't feel like it. I, I have many more questions. I think we all do, but maybe some of our thirst that uh, Auntie Janelle talked about it was quelled here. A uh, very warm thank you, dear Quentin, for this important work um, that you've been sharing with us over the past year and will continue to share. I can't now wait to actually go out and do this walk, which of course I can. I'm in Toronto with friends and partners and imagine uh, a different past, present and future for Toronto. I mean, uh, literally, I will never enter Nathan Phillips Square the same way. I mean, you know, I go to that skating rink with that snack bar that you talked about and I will now forever uh, see it uh, as a house of uh, a black leader in, in Toronto's history. A big thank you too, of course, to both Paul Farber and Ken Lum, who've been spectacular partners with Monument Lab in Philadelphia and their intensive and generous partnership on the overall Shaping the Past project. Uh, Dory Tunstall was immediately on board and, and Janelle's been so uh, very generous today as a storm was nearing to uh, do this libation and bring her thoughts and wishes. The project and the conversation around shaping the past will continue. Please, um, you can join our arts and culture newsletter at the Goethe and visit our events calendar to hear about upcoming programs. We are in the middle of our co-production with uh, Toronto-based German artist, Benita Bailey, who engages black Canadian and German performing artists in uh, lively and casual social media interviews. Um, you can find them on our YouTube channel. We have an online free screening coming up on November 5th of the North American premiere of the documentary, We Almost Lost Bochum. And that's a look at the burgeoning West German hip hop scene in the 90s, which was influenced and co-created with black German artists. So, you know, it's not that this is a 2020 conversation. And then interestingly, together with Holocaust Education Week, uh, this November, we will offer a virtual reading project around Susan Neyman's a very important and attention grabbing book, Learning from the Germans, um, that will include discussions around slavery and black activism in Canada, as well as questions around the commemoration of indigenous history. And of course, questions of, of how Germany is, has dealt with its history, its problematic histories, um, and how we've been teaching and learning uh, from each other, hopefully. We'd love to hear your thoughts. So please stay in touch. Thank you for participating in and attending our Shaping the Past program. Good night. <laughs>